GetCo News. Special coverage of the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference is brought to you by First Mining Gold. The market sell-off is not quite over. This is the theme of our discussion with Global Tigre of the Independent Speculator. We'll be talking about how to protect yourself in the coming storm. Well, the storms are already come, Lobo. You're saying there's more to the winds, so to speak. Yeah, well, first, I did not predict the crash of 2020. I'm not here to pat myself on the back. Yeah. And we haven't really gone over the waterfall yet. 2022, Switching, you mean? Sorry, 2022, yes. Yeah. Um, but it just so happens that the title of the current edition of The Independent Speculator is Navigating the Rapids Above Niagara Falls. And my concern about a near-term waterfall event in the markets, broader markets, everything, is higher now than it has been since 2020 when we went over. Um, so uh, this isn't just rhetoric. This isn't just me trying to grab headlines here. I have literally like yanked my entire shopping list because I don't want to be putting any more cash at risk right now in front of what could be depending on how you look at it, you know, this big crash or this big buying opportunity. You're not in the gold, uh, gold equities at all? I didn't say I sold everything. I said I yanked my shopping list. I'm not uh, buying. I don't want to, you know. Uh, and actually, that's a really important point, David, because I, I wrote, to, not to get our crashes mixed up, but right. I wrote an article last year, uh, just around this time, where yeah. it looked like there was elevated risk called the crash of 2021 question mark. Yeah. And they warned people, don't sell everything because, okay, it looks scary, but right. what if it doesn't crash and you sell everything open to buy cheaper and then it goes up, yeah. which is actually what happened. So to be clear right now, I'm saying something similar. Well, I'm not selling everything because what if, you know, the powers that be pivot, everything goes up again, right? And you've sold and you're left behind. I, well, I want to go back to the equities, but I'm just looking at the gold price right now in our app. And, you know, you mentioned something uh, very important yesterday at our gold panel, that, which is that, yes, $1,800 is a little bit uh, off the highs. Uh, but still, zoom out. Let's take yeah. some, let's, let's look at it from a broader picture perspective. $1,800 gold is already still very good for cash flows for the miners. It's very, it, you know, it, it, it's much higher than where we were five years ago. So from a longer term perspective, current prices are not terrible. Um, All true, but not just a longer term perspective. I'm not just trying to tell people, oh, don't feel so bad, 1800 isn't so bad. If you look at the headwinds, I mean, you had, you, Nomi Prince was on there talking about the strength of the dollar, Forex strength, of course, not real strength, but strength of the dollar. You've got interest rates. Right now, as you and I speak, people are dumping stocks. They're buying bonds, even though the Fed is gonna be selling because there's fear in the air. Uh, in these, so in these environments, those are bad for gold. So to see gold still holding 1800 in face of these headwinds tells you something. And then there's what you're referencing. You look at you know, charts over the last six months after the, you know, the new Fed pivot and things start falling apart. And you've got the Dow down, the S&P down, NASDAQ down. You've got gold 2.0 yeah. way down. And gold's holding on. Right. In the face of headwinds, that's actually outperformance. Where, 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 this market crash that you're talking about, that hasn't yet fully uh, materialized, what's going to be the driver of this crash beyond what we've already seen? Well, I think, put it mildly, you know, I think uh, investors on Wall Street, they think they know what's coming. They think they've priced in the Fed's tightening, but I don't think they really know. We're in uncharted waters. Nobody really knows what's going to happen, not even me. Yes. Um, but to the degree that things have been priced in, I don't think they've been priced in enough. I mean, Fed double tightening, last time that didn't work out so well, late 2018, right? And yeah. Powell pivoted, right? right? And, you know, people are talking about soft landing and, oh, we can manage these things. But the, the last time the comparable situation in, you know, stagflationary environment, 1970, and rem remember, we had a negative U.S. GDP print in Q1. Yeah. Things aren't looking so great now. We could be in recession right now with high inflation. We could be in stagflation right now, depending on how you define it. So, it, yeah. sorry, real quick. Last time this happened, it was a completely different world. We weren't recovering from a pandemic. Mm -hmm. We weren't so globally interdependent. We didn't have a new iron curtain going up with war in Europe. Right? It was a very different situation. And to think that the Fed can just you know, raise rates and, and cure inflation so easily, I think it's a fantasy. It's not going to happen. Okay. Well, the U.S. dollar is something that uh, is very much uh, related to the gold price. There's been periods in the last year when they've moved in tandem together which we've discussed is rather unusual. Now they're back to their more historically usual inverse correlation in the, in the past three months or two months or so. Uh, gold's fallen off its $2,000 level and the dollar has continued to rise on the back of higher interest rates. What does this relationship tell you about the future of gold? Can we expect further dollar strength to weigh down on the gold price? Well, this 
this is kind of an off again, on again thing with yeah. gold paying more attention to the dollar price than the interest rate. Yes. And when you have interest rates nailed to the floor, it made sense that you might. The reason why gold's number one relationship over the last 15 years has been not only one, but the strongest driver has been real rates. Yeah. Um, ever since the dollar was separated from gold. So that's the, the main driver. But recently, though, with rates nailed at the floor, not moving, you, you know, markets are looking for other signals. And I think that's why we saw it moving more inversely directly with the dollar. Instead of what the rates tell you about where the dollar will be, rates aren't telling us anything, so we're going to look at the dollar directly. That's come again, gone again a little bit. Recently, it's actually been stronger again. And the good news here, I mean, this, the bad news is good news. The bad news is, pick your metaphor, clean his shirt and the dirty laundry hamper, all these things, prettiest mayor at the glue factory. Right. right. The dollar appears strong. That is absolutely, no question, a headwind for gold right now. Um, but the reality is that the dollar only appears strong. The mayor is still in the glue factory. The dirty laundry hamper is still the dirty laundry hamper. And anybody going to the store, anybody paying rent, they know that their dollars are worth less on their way to being perhaps worthless now than they were a month ago, or six months ago, or a year ago. They see that. So I do think that the good news here is that to the degree that the, you know, the gold is trading more directly with the dollar, I'm actually a dollar bear. Near term, because of all these crazy things going around the world, is this flight to perceived safety that's giving the dollar a tailwind. Yeah. But I don't think that lasts. I think the US uh, is a leader, not a laggard, in currency debasement right now. Okay, so we've got a big number of big macro forces at play here. We've got rising interest rates, we've got the war in Ukraine, uh, geopolitical risks are rising all around the world. Uh, energy costs are rising, inflation obviously is a concern. So where would you put your money? You'd say you're no longer shopping for anything right now, but if you had to deploy capital into something right now, what would it be? Two answers. One is uranium. Okay. And just generally, we've talked about the uranium thesis. Yes. Don't need to go over it all again. But yeah. the key point here is that uranium is, should be and will be seen separately from the rest. Like if the macro picture goes to heck in a handbasket, you still need your baseload energy. And the supply and demand fundamentals, you know, Sprott hoovering up all the cheap pounds, all that stuff is still on the table. So very bullish on uranium. That's not an if, that's a when kind of question. You know, absent a major nuclear accident. Uranium right now is probably the most solid uh, commodity speculation of all right now, in my view, so like over the next year. Um, but for the gold and silver stocks, and this, that, you know, that space that we love so much, I'm bullish on all commodities, really. If we have stagflation, deflation part is bullish for all commodities prices. Tricky for the mining business because your input costs go up, but still good for the commodities. So the other thing, I said two things. One was uranium. The other thing is if we get this downturn I'm looking for or, or worried about, if there's an actual crash or just market weakness, the blue chips in the space will be on sale. So your you know, top you know, top gold miners in the world, your top royalty plays, you know, the, the top dogs, I don't want to name any names. The, the, the list is quite small. I'm sure the audience knows who I'm talking about. These guys will go on sale. They'll, it'll be, you know, babies with the bathwater. And if you can get these stocks, which are about as low risk leverage to underlying metals prices available, you can get them on sale. That's actually a, a no brainer trade to me. I mean, people are used to me focusing on the junior mining stocks. I don't really own the majors if I can avoid it. They're not hockey stick potential. But if you can actually buy during a market crash, even the majors can give you hockey stick type gains with much less risk than your juniors. So this is different for me. This is something that I've talked about with independent speculator clients. It's like, look, if this happens, the top of my, sh my shopping list changes. The top goes to these top dog producers, which normally I wouldn't even look at. Right, right. Okay, but last question, the equity decline, isn't that gonna pull down uranium stocks as well? Oh, absolutely, no question. I didn't say run out and buy uranium today. I'm saying in this context, yeah. you know, uranium, unless we go back to the stone age, uranium's not going away. You so a market that. downturn, I, yeah. I think, temporarily wax uranium, temporarily creates a buying opportunity, but it doesn't change the story. Okay. All right, we'll delve, we'll delve into the uranium thesis again in more detail. Lobo, thank you so much for dropping by our booth. Thank Pleasure you, Pleasure to speak with you as always. Thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lynn. Kitco News, special coverage of the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference is brought to you by First Mining Gold.